Thank you very much, Lena, and uh, well done for um, resisting swatting that fly there. It's um, very annoying, but um, very pleased to be in Edinburgh again on a crisp uh, autumnal morning with a little whiff of malt in the air as well, just to remind me of um, what it's all about here in Aldriki. Um, so what I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is provide some um, uh, high-hanging fruit, if you like, um, of uh, the, the facts and figures that um, lie behind uh, clean energy worldwide and also narrowing it down to um, the UK and Scotland a bit as well. Um, so I've entitled this When the Going Gets Tough, and you, you'll see why, because 2012 has definitely been quite a difficult year for the clean energy sector worldwide. No sector ever, um, growth sector ever grows in a straight line uh, without having some uh, bumps along the way, and 2012 has seen some bumps. So we'll explore those in the next few minutes. Uh, now I sort of divided it, uh, it up into the, the overall investment trend um, problems, uh, a lot of supportive factors. Then you uh, look at UK and Scotland specifically, and I've actually sort of put in some subheadings there. Uh, the going's not only getting tough, it's also getting rough, and uh, there's something coming down the track, and uh, climb any mountain uh, possibly. And, and those who can uh, remember the 1980s might um, twig that there's uh, something in common in some of those phrases. And so this is my inspiration for the day is uh, Billy Ocean, and his fine uh, song from uh, mid 80s, I think. So let's start off with um, the, the figures for clean energy investment worldwide. Uh, Lena mentioned 257 billion. That's the renewal, renewable powers and, and fuel uh, number. This uh, number of 280 billion in 2011 also includes energy smart technologies, so investment in uh, electric vehicles and smart grids and, and so on, so slightly higher number. But what you can see from that is that since 2004 there's been a spectacular growth in worldwide investment in clean energy, some years faster than others, 31 percent I think between 2009 and 2010. Uh, was the, the highest recent one. There was 13% growth in 2011. And we'll get an idea of what's happening in 2012 in a minute. First of all, how, what's that made up of? And I've got a, a dangerous um, laser pen here. Um, so we've got, working from the left, we've got venture capital investment, corporate research and development, government research and development, private equity investment in companies, public markets, new equity investment. And this is a sort of... Um, company and early stage element of 46 billion. There was $164 billion in 2011 of asset finance of wind farms, solar parks and so on. 76 billion of small scale, which is largely um, rooftop solar and um, other small scale solar. And that takes us to that $280 billion figure. And then there was another 76 billion of um, acquisition activity and refinancings of one sort or another. So total activity, if you want to talk about that, could be uh, $356 billion. Lots of money. Um, big countries, no big uh, surprise really on the leading two, the US and China. China was ahead for a couple of years, but the US uh, nipped back ahead in 2011. Um, it had a couple of um, really important stimulus programs that came to a head and expired uh, late in that year. So a lot of financings were rushed forward and that really boosted the US figure. Um, it won't be in the lead this year, as we'll see. Uh, Germany, superpower in renewable energy, again, very strong year. Also Italy. And you can see from those two, actually, that the, the blue part of their line is the dominant one. And this is the small-scale distributive system. So they had, had real booms in rooftop solar, and that drove their investment last year. India also had a very strong year. The UK not too, doing too badly there, 9 billion, up um, I think 59% year on year. Um, so that was a decent, a decent performance and some of the other countries coming in down there. Um, what about uh, the different sectors and how they've performed? Well, this has changed very interestingly over the years because if you go back to 2006, for instance, you'll see that biofuels, this sort of mauve line here, was the second largest sector behind wind um, as we got the US corn ethanol boom and also the Brazilian sugar ethanol boom. Uh, solar was back in third place. Um, but since then, solar has really taken off and it um, got ahead of wind in 2010 just. And then in 2011 was a long way ahead of wind. 
Um, biofuels was back in fourth place. Uh, in third still was biomass and, and waste to energy, which has been a steady sector over all these years, and little bits of small hydro, geothermal, and a tiny bit of marine coming into the picture there as well. Now, uh, one of the interesting issues is, is how does um, clean energy stack up against uh, fossil fuel power? And um, our estimates are that uh, last year there were 82 gigawatts of new renewable capacity put in worldwide, um, plus another 15 of large hydro, making a total of 97 gigawatts. Um, and the fossil fuel power, there was a net 106 gigawatts added worldwide. So actually those two numbers are pretty close. So there's almost as much um, new capacity in renewable power going in as in fossil fuel power, and that's a very striking um, comparison. There's a bit, there's a bit of replacement um, happening on fossil fuels, so you can get a bigger gross number than that, but the net number, 106 gigawatts. Um, the, the percentage of electricity generated by new renewables is still small though worldwide, 6% up from 5.1%. That's because it's starting from a, a low base and also the intermittency. Um, so a gigawatt of wind is not equivalent to a gig gigawatt of fossil fuel power in terms of the electricity generated. Um, going gets rough, so let's have a look at 2012. Now this shows the quarterly picture of investment, and um, you can see there were a couple of very strong quarters there in 2011 with these, particularly those US programs uh, coming to, to their conclusion. Um, and Investments continued reasonably well worldwide since then. We actually published a figure yesterday which, for the third quarter, which came in at 56.6 billion. So it was another reasonable quarter, but it, it does now look pretty certain that 2012 will be a down year for investment in clean energy worldwide, the first down year since um, before 2004. Um, it'll still be a high number overall. It'll be $200 billion plus, but... Um, it looks as if there will be some kind of fall. And here are some of the problems that are contributing to that situation. Uh, first of all, uncertainty over policy support in, in key countries. We're going to hear an awful lot about this, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, US is a prime example, as we'll see in a moment. Also, some in the UK, Italy as well, another big market where there's uncertainty. Um, and there's been some downright negative policy moves in some countries. I mentioned Spain here and Bulgaria very recently. Um, then there's financing challenges, so the banks are not in the, in the sort of rude health that they were five or six years ago and able to provide money in quite the same way. Um, there are fewer banks lending. You've got the Baal, two, the Baal three um, issue in terms of tenors, so banks are saying you can have some money, but it'll only be for seven or eight years rather than 15 years, and that makes a difference to project economics. And then you've got utilities in some countries under pressure as a kind of feedback from the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Um, and then um, there's quite a lot of manufacturers now struggling in, in wind and solar um, because of overcapacity. So um, it's been bankruptcies, um, Q-cells being one of the high-profile ones. Uh, Vestas, um, leading wind turbine maker, has had a bumpy time, uh, cut a lot of jobs, um, still looking for a way through that, and SunTech, the leading uh, solar module uh, maker, also is having some difficult times. So there's a lot of pain in the manufacturing supply chain. Um, and meanwhile, um, there's a lot of skirmishing still going on in uh, uh, the whole area of climate change and clean energy, and um, that's kind of disturbing the, uh, the, the perception of voters about the issue, and that feeds through to um, the political sphere as well. Now, the U.S. is a classic example of the policy uncertainty issue. The um, production tax credit is a key incentive for particularly the wind sector in the U.S. And uh, you can see that in 2012, we're expecting a lot of, in of gigawatts to be installed there, 11.8 gigawatts of wind. Um, but the PTC is coming up for expiry at the end of this year. And if it's not uh, extended by Congress, then we think the U.S. wind industry is going to collapse to only 1.5 gigawatts next year, which would be extremely painful for all the manufacturers. If Congress does get its act together after the presidential election and sign something off, um, then the figure could be higher. It could be four, four billion or, sorry, four gigawatts or so, um, which would be better, but it would still be a major fall from this year. 
Um, the share price picture has also been uh, somewhat negative for the sector. There was a, a boom, a bubble, if you like, in clean energy stocks up to the end of 2007, then increasing 4.5-fold, uh, and then crashing in the recession, starting to recover, but then underperforming severely um, in recent years, 40% um, underperformance compared to the S&P 500 last year. And uh, that's largely due to the problems in the supply chain, manufacturers not making money as prices come down and their margins get squeezed. Um, on, this, on the topic of the, the, the skeptics and the arguments that are still going on, there are sort of all kinds of skirmishes happening, and um, sometimes people who are skeptical on one thing pop up being skeptical on something else. But um, there's, there are people who are saying that climate change isn't happening. There are people saying it is happening, but it's not due to human activity. There are people saying that it's happening and it's man-made, but it's not worth doing anything about it. There's people saying that it's worth doing something about it, but not investing in renewable energy, doing something else. Some people saying renewable energy is too expensive. Some people um, critical of wind turbines. And quite a few of those, there is a decent date, debate to be had on them. But I think what would help both the skeptics and the people on the other side is if we could at least agree um, two or three of these topics and concentrate on the ones where there really is uh, proper room for debate and, and making decisions about the future. OK, but there's lots of supportive factors out there. I've listed a few here. I mean, another one that I was talking uh, about with um, Ron Hazelar this morning is, is the water issue, uh, which is becoming quite important for renewable energy in some countries um, since uh, onshore wind and PV use far, far less water than any of the other technologies you could use. But I've listed here science, costs, geography, and economic impact. Sorry. Um, so on the uh, science side, uh, the evidence really has been stacking up very heavily, even since Al Gore spoke to us a year ago at this event. Um, the percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere is rising inexorably. It was 370 parts per million in 2002. It's now 391. Um, Arctic sea ice reached its lowest ever last month, uh, roughly half the 79 to 2000 average. Nine of the 10 warmest years in the modern meteorological record have it occurred since 2000. And there are lots of others, like July 2012 was probably the hottest ever month that the US has, has had. Um, but those are at least three to be going on with. Um, costs are very exciting issue for renewable energy because the comparisons have really, really improved in the last couple of years. Um, the, the price of uh, PV modules has fallen by 75% over four years. The uh, price of uh, onshore wind turbines has come down by 25% over two years. Um, but if we look at the levelized costs, so that's including not just capital costs but all the other elements, then um, the numbers to concentrate on here are these percentage changes. This is a three-year comparison, so we can see how different technologies have uh, evolved over that time. And you can see that, let's start off with onshore wind. So the, the um, levelized cost there has improved by 15% over three years. Look at some of these PV technologies, 54%, 47%, 36%. So really major improvements in cost competitiveness. Um, the only one that's been going the wrong direction is offshore wind partly due to sort of bottlenecks in the supply chain, but also that developers are moving to do more difficult projects in deeper water, which is obviously going to cost more money. Uh, if you look at the fossil fuel uh, ones, coal up 37%, uh, gas up 32%. So these, these are the sort of uh, median range here. You can see if you come down from onshore wind, onshore wind is very close to competitiveness with coal and um, getting closer on natural gas. And we think by 2016, it'll be uh, fully cost competitive, even for the average project worldwide. Uh, on solar, um, grid parity is, is looming for, um, this is for uh, small scale solar, so residential. Um, the way to look at this chart is uh, the higher up a country is in the chart, then the more expensive its electricity prices. And the further, further over to the right uh, country is then um, the more insulation and insulation it has, so more sunshine. So no surprise, the United Kingdom is pretty far over on the left on the sunshine front. 
And uh, if you ask where Scotland is, well, I guess St Andrews is probably about there and Ballahoolish and Fort William probably about here. But um, what we're seeing in this chart is that in a lot of countries, it's already, even on the basis of the 2012 levelised cost, it's already worthwhile putting at least some solar on your roof um, because the, uh, you can generate electricity more competitively than uh, you're paying for the, the retail electricity uh, through the grid. So that's true of Denmark, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Australia, and Brazil at the moment. And once we get further improvements by 2015 in PV cost competitiveness will be true also of Netherlands, Japan, France, large parts of the US, Israel. So um, that's becoming a real driver of, of the PV sector. And um, drawing from that, this is our conservative scenario, so it's also an optimistic scenario. But if you look at PV demand worldwide, it was 28.7 gigawatts in 2011, a record, uh, Germany and Italy being the two biggest drivers there. And at the beginning of this year, the equivalent forecast that we had was for 21 gigawatts this year. So we thought there'd be a big fall in demand. We're now saying 28.4 gigawatts, even on the conservative forecast. And I think our optimistic one is more like 35. Um, so we've had to revise up substantially our forecast for PV this year. Um, what, what you're seeing is a geographical switch. So Germany and Italy gradually becoming less important uh, Japan is this um, orange one. So Japan is becoming a really important market uh, for PV. And then uh, China also. And um, excitingly, the rest of the world, other countries outside the sort of usual suspects, becoming um, more and more important for the PV industry and actually for all sectors of renewable energy. As is, uh, we call this, here comes the rest of the world. So this is our chief executive um, a piece that we put together a couple of months ago and there are more and more signs that clean energy is moving out from the uh, established markets of Europe, the US and China into all kinds of other places in the world and there's some really strong activity happening in some of those countries. And I've got a bit of a test for you coming up on this next slide. This is a, a sort of uh, image uh, copied straight from our database of projects and deals. So this is um, asset finance deals in the third quarter of 2012. And I took this snapshot um, a week or so ago. So there's been a couple of big deals entered since then, one in Ukraine for small hydro and um, also one in uh, North Africa. But uh, does anybody know what that flag is there? Well, I can tell you it's Morocco. So the biggest deal of the quarter at this point was in Morocco. And that's not something you'd have expected to see before. Um, Chinese deal, um, Australian deal, uh, US, OK. Uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, China coming in again, Canada, Brazil, uh, Australia. First UK deal there at Plymouth for a waste to energy plant. China, uh, Brazil, Mongolia. Again, a very surprising name there. Uh, Japan. So what you're not seeing there is much from the US and virtually nothing from Europe. So um, other countries are really coming to the fore in clean energy and that's a very exciting development. Uh, one of the supports I mentioned was, was the economic impact one and uh, clean energy is already uh, an important contributor on the job front. These are our estimates sort of painstakingly put together on um, the different sectors and um, how many jobs in 2011 uh, and 2020 could be um, directly linked to these sectors. So for onshore wind, um, this one here, so it's about half a million jobs in 2011. Um, PV, um, more like 700, nearly 700,000 in 2011. So we're looking for the overall total for these four sectors to go up to about 2 million from 1.2 million in 2011, 2 million in 2020. And we'll see this one here, offshore wind. That's obviously very important to Scotland. Um, now, these, these numbers would be considerably higher for 2020, were it not for the fact that we're factoring in really major improvements in productivity. So, uh, for instance, in the case of PV, things like 5% year-on-year improvements in productivity. Also, in offshore wind, big improvements in productivity. So, if you get better productivity, you need fewer workers per megawatt. 
Um, and just a snapshot of, of that employment calculation on onshore wind. There's a lot of different elements going on, some te uh, permanent jobs, some temporary, and they're difficult to add together, but we've, we've done them in terms of 2011. Um, so you can see that operations and maintenance was only about 0.1 jobs per megawatt worldwide. Uh, construction was more significant, 1.3 jobs per megawatt. Biggest one, though, turbine manufacturer, 8.5 jobs per megawatt. And then there's uh, high skill ones also in things like project development and financial services. And then for offshore wind, a similar picture, more jobs there in construction because they are more difficult to construct and there's more people um, in ships and operating cranes and, and building foundations and so on. Uh, cables, quite interesting in offshore wind. Um, again, the turbine manufacturer, a very, very big part of the picture. Okay, UK and Scotland, climb any mountain. So uh, investment in, in the UK has, has been all right, actually. It um, had a strong year in 2009 with uh, two very big offshore wind financings, one of which we're going to hear about in a minute. Um, dropped off a bit in 2010. 2011, there was a big um, small-scale solar boom, particularly in uh, England. There was about one gigawatt of PV put in, uh, much more than the government had bargained for and that um, pushed the figure up. The asset finance, the sort of big-scale projects, was um, relatively low last year. Um, sorry, I'm giving you the wrong thing. That's solar. That's, this is wind. Wind was relatively low. Solar was big because of the small-scale boom, and um, there was a bit of biomass and waste coming in. So we, the way things are going, we're expecting a pretty good figure, so it'll be fairly comparable with two, 2011 this year. Some of the deals we've seen so far this year... Uh, the Lynx um, offshore wind financing off England, $1.6 billion. A um, couple of waste to energy deals in England in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, a sort of part England, part Scotland financing by terra firma of some wind farms, $120 million. Carrigheel uh, wind farm in Scotland, uh, $144 million. That was, that was just the debt side, so there was also equ equity on top of that. Um, so there are some decent deals happening. Um, but the only thing is uh, deals are not happening as quickly as people want, so we're all having to be patient. Looking specifically at offshore wind, this is the uh, Sheringham Shoal project. Uh, this is our forecast for um, wind, uh, offshore wind installations over the next few years. You can see in 2012, the UK is the dominant country for installations, with a little bit from Germany um, and virtually nothing from anybody else. UK is still biggest in 2013, um, and we're seeing some from other places like Belgium, for instance, next year. And then in 2014, suddenly the biggest player on our forecast is going to be China. So China's really going to jump into offshore wind in a big way, and we think that it'll be the biggest market in most of these years out to 2020. The UK and Germany still remaining very important. Um, but Germany's being held back a bit at the moment by grid connection issues. The UK, um, there's obviously uncertainty over the policy side and um, to some extent over financing, so we're going to be held back a bit by this on our forecasts. Hydro is an interesting one. This is the Sloy scheme in Scotland, I think. Um, so we're saying that um, uh, UK and Europe are running out of new project opportunities and in fact the uh, UK National Renewable Energy Plan is only envisaging about uh, 300 megawatts of new capacity by 2020 in hydro but what we are seeing in hydro it's becoming a really key balancing technology for intermittent generation so when the wind isn't blowing you know you can bring in hydro and uh, specifically pump storage is becoming massively important um, to address the grid integration issues. And grid integration is probably the biggest issue facing renewable energy now, I would say, even, even more than the cost side, which is as kind of, we can see the future in terms of what's happening on cost. Grid, grid integration, um, the future is a little bit less clear. It will be addressed, but how it will be addressed, um, we'll have to see. And then uh, wave and tidal, these are 14 of the leading technologies. Um, some of the, these, I think, are represented in this room. So there's a lot of technologies out there competing for the future market. Not all of them will succeed by any means. Um, but um, 
over the last few years, a lot of money's been invested in this. We reckon $600 million uh, from the balance sheets of the leading technology developers. Um, this winter, very excitingly, several machines should be operating, generating power through the winter at EMEC in Orkney, and that'll be the first time. And by next spring, we will hopefully be able to say that um, Machine X and Machine Y um, have, have survived a winter and um, that their future is, is looking a lot more promising than, than we've seen up to now. Um, so the UK is the centre of world activity, but there's quite a bit going on also in other countries. Um, and we're seeing the big engineering companies really moving in in a big way. So um, big names like ABB, Siemens, Alstom, Andritz, uh, these companies are no mugs and they only move into a sector when they think it's got real potential and they've got involved in some of the um, specialised uh, technology developers. Okay, this is the final one. Um, this is looking at the UK's national renewable energy uh, plans in relation to four different sectors, and it gives you an idea how ambitious they are. Um, on offshore wind, the plan is to have 13 gigawatts by 2020, and that's compared to 1.3 gigawatts in 2011, so a massive jump. And actually, in, in the latest document from DEC, the 2020 roadmap, map, it was talking of 18 gigawatts. So there's a massive amount to do there. Um, on onshore wind, uh, the NREAP was for 15 gigawatts, and the roadmap more recently been saying 13 gigawatts, up from 5 gigawatts. So there's obviously a big planning question mark there about whether we can actually get the permission to build that much onshore wind. On wave and tidal, uh, the NREAP had been hoping for 1.3 gigawatts by 2020, but the more recent roadmap has seems to have scaled that back to about 300 megawatts. And actually, I think that might be a little bit on the conservative side. We might manage maybe uh, four, or, four or 500 megawatts of wave and tidal if, if some of these technologies um, test well in the next year or two by 2020. And then I haven't said anything really about heat, but there's some enormously ambitious targets for heat. Um, I could have put um, biomass heaters up here, but instead I put heat pumps. We've got um, only... 0.5 terawatt hours of heat pump power uh, of heat pump heat at the moment in 2011 and the plan is for that to get to 19 terawatt hours by 2020 so if that's going to happen there's going to be some serious money made by by some people in, in that particular sector and we'll hopefully hear more about that over the next over the next couple of days so I'd like now to call upon um, a man who can tell us how to achieve some of these very difficult targets and um, that's first minister of Scotland Alex Salmond.